Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy News Beat Daily Stand Up. This is the weekly edition. Today is Saturday, the 21st. I hope you are having an absolutely wonderful day. Please take your time and prepare a little bit because we may have some grid outages. We never know when we have disasters or anything. It's always great to be prepared. Uh, the staff is going to put together our stories. Michael and I have been busy. We have had a great week with a bunch of different stories out there. So sit back and enjoy. And I'm turning this right over to the staff. Have a great day. Why Kamala Harris would be a total disaster for American energy. And Michael, let me tease this story up with a line in here out of the story. This story is out of the Daily Caller. And people don't understand that in 2019, in 2019, building on the incredible innovations of the shale revolution and the pro-energy policies of the Trump administration, the United States became the net energy exporter for the first time in nearly 70 years. At the same time, the country had the largest net reduction of energy-related carbon dioxide CO2 emissions in the world throughout the Trump administration. The United States also reduced air pollution by 7%. You can have your energy and you can clean the air and you can do it together. The reason that I like this article is because I agree that it is going to be a disaster for the consumer for American energy policies. Yeah, I think this headline is a little bit deceiving. If I were to write this headline, I would say why Kamala Harris would be a total energy disaster for the American energy consumer because well, it, i do think what's going to happen is oil prices are going to maybe not go to 150 dollars. i think that's a little bit of you know look yeah, at me I over don't... here i'm i'm being crazy but i do think you're going to consistently 80 to 95 dollar oil and that from a consumer standpoint it's not going to help out inflation you're going to see higher prices at the grocery store exactly contrary to what people think higher prices at the grocery store have a lot to do with the transportation cost of getting that food from one place or the other it's not just the inputs going into the food itself it's actually it's getting diesel. it to the grocery store. You'll also see extremely higher prices at the pump. I was driving around today, $2.50 gas. Now, right. that's the that has more to do with some of the refinery stuff. It's also partly due to what we've seen in the last week with oil prices. So, you know, one thing you'll never hear out of these, you know, oil executives sitting over there in Midland, you know, at the Houston Petroleum Club or up here at the Dallas Petroleum Club, they will never tell you that secretly they would love nothing more than $95 oil. Now, they would probably come out and say, well, that just means our cost of services are going to go up. Our margins aren't going to necessarily stay the same. I call baloney. I think secretly they're all sitting there like, hey, if Trump wins, we're probably going to have less regulation. We're probably hopefully going to see, you know, service costs go down because inflation will come down a little bit. And that's what's really hurting our margins. But if Kamala wins, we'll see higher prices and continue to make our nice margins. So I think, ironically, the ENP companies think they're in a win-win. Now, you can't just look at it. That's a very... As I said in the intro, Stu, that's a pretty selfish look if you're an EMP operator. But what do you, as an as a CEO of an enter, as an oil and gas okay. company, it's your job to that's your only focus if is if on I was an sure you make a lot of money. So I, I think I, from a consumer standpoint, it's it's going to hurt tremendously. There's going to be pain at the pump. You're going to see higher prices, restrictive oil and gas drilling. It's it's going to be really tough. You bet. Offshore wind decimating sea life. Fishermen accuse Biden Heron of cover up. Got to give a shout out to our buddy there, Michael Schellenberger. Mm -hmm. Love him. Why now? Be in part because of the recent collapse of a giant wind turbine, which I covered with David Blackman, Irina Slav, and Tammy Nemeth on the energy reality off the coast of Massachusetts, which scattered jagged pieces of fiberglass. Take a moment. This video is an outstanding video. 
when the offshore wind developers came commercial, they're now not able to find lobster. They're not finding fish. They're not finding all of these things. But Michael, I did not know until I started getting into this and following Michael Schellenberg, the microplastics, how much wind farm material actually gets into the fish. It's not just the dead whales. And I, I know that you don't mind a dead whale or two, but it's actually all of the fish and the microplastics is huge. Well, we've decimated our, our fish population, not necessarily from the wind farm, but just from overconsumption, overfishing, all that stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's clear I'm no fan of the whales, and this might be the one positive byproduct of offshore wind. The microplastics, I think, are interesting, though, from the standpoint of, you know, that's something everybody can agree on. I, I read some stat the other day. We eat a credit card's worth, like a credit card thin and wide worth right. of plastics every single year. And I mean, think about it. everything you buy comes in plastics. And right. you know, a lot of the food you eat is directly sourced from that. I think it's interesting. There's a great graph. I don't, it's not on it's it's in the source article. It's not necessarily in here, but they show a graph of the whale population i mean it's completely crashing that slope is massively downward we lost eight last year the you know down from 348 to 340 the lifespan of these whales are going down thank goodness again but i I think it's interesting that the fishermen who generally you would consider clearly as environmentalists are trying to bring this to the attention of anybody who will listen and nobody will listen Only when it's politically convenient do people care about the environment. I think that's the overarching thing to remember here is that it's only politically convenient to talk about the environment when it favors you. When it doesn't, mouth shut. And I and I and I just really am am tired of it's about pollution and energy poverty. If you married good policies to end energy poverty with the environment, we would have low cost energy. All right. We would. We absolutely would. Italy's central bank helps poorer countries fund energy transition. Book, bull, uh, bull hockey. I'm, I'm sorry. I just had to do that one. I love that in Animal House, and it is absolutely applicable here. Financing transition projects in emerging market and developing economies, ease, Michael, just for those uneducated guys like me, can be twice as expensive in advanced economies, Panetta told a G7 international agency IEA conference in Rome. The resources would be more than offset the economic damage avoided from the climate change they would suffer. This is bullcrap. They are missing the boat. Why don't we export the West's great technology of clean coal burning, natural gas, and reduce emissions and teach that and then make money with the poorer countries instead of making money on the poorer countries. I I look at it this way. This is a basically, here's the thing. You're not going to get economic energy output from building this stuff. No. Okay. So hopefully because this money is just going to be get distributed to companies to build the infrastructure. Hopefully those companies are based in these poor countries. They're not. Knowing what will most likely happen is large multinational companies will come in. They'll bring in multinational workers and none of that money will actually flow into the country other than they will be stuck with this horrible higher cost energy when they should have probably just built natural gas. Even if natural gas multi conglomerates come in and build the natural gas infrastructure, at least you end up with cheaper power, whereas this you're going to end up with higher power and no jobs. That's the, I mean, I'm not against just injecting money into a poorer economy. Might as well. I mean, we, 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 there could be worse things, but I'm down to give, you know, but I would, this I would is not give, a great way to do it. No, this is, and, and this is a typical deal that is going on with the West to the poorer countries. It is ludicrous and the wrong way to do it. So Canada and Mexico boost competition for LNG for U.S. exports to Asia. This is pretty cool. Canada could potentially supply 36.2 million tons of LNG 
per year by 2040 in Mexico, another 36.7 million tons. That's a lot of LNG. That's a, a large part of LNG. I think they're getting on. I think they're getting in on that game relatively because we've seen now the LNG export facility ban get lifted, and they're they're they they're, they're now there's a global competition. It's the great part about allowing us to participate in the global market is allows us to take a lot of the natural gas that's stored up here and ship it elsewhere. Now, from a security standpoint, I like all the natural gas here because we need cheap energy here. Yes, yes it do. hurts those people out in West Day, you know, those oil and gas producers who who are selling negative, you know, negative differentials to Waha, but a hey, joke's on you. Yeah, right, right. I tell you though, and and I want to just talk to any Sierra Club. If you're a Sierra Club out there and your head still not exploded by having more LNG exporting around the world, come talk to us. We want you on the podcast. We'll we'll be nice to you and just ask some real questions. Do you want the lower pollution around the world? Then let the U.S export LNG and put an end to coal plants where they have an import facility. I yeah. like No, absolutely. I completely agree with you. You know, if and you know, specifically with Canada and Mexico trying to boost their output. I mean, this is this would be great for Mexico, to be honest with you. Mexico needs to find ways to increase revenue and this would be a great cool. great way to do that. Right now their number one export is human trafficking into the US. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm kind of disgusted at this point okay it was funny though you're hilarious Stu. you're hilarious <laughs> follow him on x folks i guess that's 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 the perfect place to advertise your x account navy's 50 year record of power generation this is an outstanding article by ronald stein he is a friend of the show he is an author and i've had the pleasure of talking to ronald several times on the podcast and on other podcasts as well too but let's go through the numbers today about 440 nuclear reactors are in operation around 32 countries and taiwan with 62 reactors under construction as of August 1st, 2023. The United States has 54 nuclear plants with 93 operation current nuclear reactors in 28 states. These plants operate and generate 20% of our electricity in the United States. That is impressive. 93 commercial nuclear reactors in 28 states for 20%. That's a big number. As of May 2024, there are 214 nuclear permanently shut down nuclear reactors around the world. The United States recorded the largest number of shutdown with 41 units. Holy smokes. Another seven reactor retirements have been announced through 2025 with total generating capacity of, being, of these being shut down is 7,109 megawatts equal to 7% of the net nuclear fleet. Holy smokes. Consistent and reliable power delivery is a national security issue and a quality of life issue. People and economics have to have grown to depend on electricity so much they can no longer have alternative methods to place uh, replace heat, light, food, preservation, air conditioning in the event of a power outage. So economic electricity must be delivered to people 100 percent of the time or serious disruptions in their lives and economy will be apparent, including loss of life. This is nuts. Recycling slightly used nuclear fuel in fast breeder reactors will solve these problems, and I love it. I think that we need to look at these kind of solutions. This is an outstanding article. And for the electrician, uh, there's a one hour video with Chris Powers and Robert Bryce at Power Hungry as they discuss energy policy, nuclear and fossil fuels. Outstanding job. Well done. And this is a great. The links are in the show notes. Relying on electricity, electricity interconnectors adds to a market risk. You've got to control your energy future and control your energy grid. 
In its 2023 future scenarios, National Grid, E-S-O-N-G, said to manage I, I, the Funkel uh, periods, dispatchal thermal power plants, gas and or hydrogen, depending on the scenario, are likely to be required. A combination of the ES, compressed air energy storage, and liquid energy storage, L-A-E-S, pumped hydro storage, PHS and interconnectors will all be required to manage the network during these part periods. One thing out of that paragraph that is not being told is the cost. The raw cost of that paragraph is incredible. Interconnects are incredibly expensive. The storage mechanisms that they were talking about are incredibly expensive, and it would be a lot cheaper just to use natural gas and a lot less impact on the environment. Offgem has identified electricity exports as a source of consumer disbenefit. One might assume that the countries from which countries prop up our grid with exports might realize this is bad for their domestic consumers and have a rethink. Once you put in a grid interconnect between countries and then you expect that you're going to rely on another country's fiscal responsibility, that's, a, that's not something I would want to do as a leader of a country. Interconnects are bad for energy security and long-term plans, in my opinion. Thank <laughs> you.